You're listening to Why We Do What We Do. Welcome to Why We Do What We Do. I am your insatiable host, Abraham. Ooh, and I am your exceeding caloric daily intake host, Shane, I guess. Indeed you are. (laughs) I don't know know where to go with that. That works. That works. We're a psychology podcast, and we talk about all of the psychology things across a variety of spectrum of weirdness and sometimes normalness. You know, we're kind of all over the place. Today, we're going to try and figure out what cannonballs, hot dogs, genetic (laughs) diseases, and eating literally anything that you can think of all have in common. Yeah. Sometimes we find some things and then we want to tie them all together. And here's one of those episodes. (laughs) Yeah. So if you like what you hear today, you can support us by joining us on Patreon. You can leave us a rating and review, subscribe, tell your friends, put our sticker on your water bottle, and then take that water bottle with you everywhere that you go. Mm -hmm. We'll talk more about the different ways you can support us in the end here. But today, this episode is going to be released on December 14th. And December 14th has some notable holidays worth uh, sort of celebrating and talking about. One is that it is Monkey Day. Oh, okay. I like monkeys. They're great. Yeah. It's also Roast Chestnuts Day. Okay. You're into that sort of thing. Maybe on an open fire. I mean, don't put monkeys near fires. Yeah, don't put them. Yeah, no, not together. And then it is also Free Shipping Day. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, I guess, sure. <laughs> yeah. There's multiple ways to go about this holiday. You could either teach monkeys to roast those chestnuts after you've had them shipped in for free, or Mm -hmm. you could order monkeys and get them shipped in for free while you roast chestnuts. Like, I think either of those things are fine. That's a great way to celebrate. Maybe training the monkeys is a better, more humane way than ordering monkeys online. Probably. I agree with that. Yeah. But those are celebratory practices you might take on. If you're acknowledging what December is all about, well, there's also a couple of month-long recognitions going on in December. One of them is is that it is National Write a Business Plan Month. So if you've been putting it off, now is the time. (laughs) Sounds familiar. (laughs) Yeah. It's also National Tie Month. So necktie, bow tie, whatever tie. Then not my month. It'll make me gag. (laughs) Or or maybe maybe it does have pictures of tie, uh, like ties as as recognition of the month. But maybe if you could just tie in a competition, you could maybe count that as participating. Do hair ties count? Sure. Hair ties. That works. I got one of those right now. A railroad tie, maybe. (laughs) <laughs> it's also uh and this is my favorite one i think it's universal human rights month big fan yeah we don't like that very much in america at least our political system would have you think that we don't but it is a month that i i definitely would enjoy celebrating yeah assuming that somewhere in the world people have human rights yeah i did see a news report today i don't know the validity of it but said they said um iran is finally banning the morality police so that's a good step in that direction hey there you go good Okay, well, we're not talking about any of those things for this topic. As I said, we're talking about cannonballs and Mm -hmm. hot dogs and little wooden boxes (laughs) that contain secret messages. That's largely what we're talking about. It's going to be a wild ride, folks, so get ready. We are talking about iron stomachs and kind of those unique, interesting phenomenon where people just can just eat all the things. They can eat anything. Yeah, there's sort of a variety of things we'll be talking about. One is this. So we have three stories primarily to sort of share with you about iron stomachs and versions of it. And so we're going to talk about what it is, some people who have demonstrated a version of this sort of thing, and talk about some fire eating and sword swallowing as well, and also some indigestion, I think. Yeah, so uh, this is not an advertisement for Tums. (laughs) <laughs> you know, or Meprazole or any of those acid blockers or anything like that. This is uh, strictly informational. Yes. And this is probably one of the shorter ones that we'll do, but that's okay. Um, I think that just makes it uh, easier to consume. Yeah. Sh- <laughs> <laughs> was, not, was not ready for that. So I appreciate that so much. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about someone who their version of an iron stomach was being able to eat anything. And honestly, when we're talking about iron stomachs, it's largely what we're talking about. But let's start by just telling this guy's story. Yeah, this story is about a man named Terer. That's kind of how I'm reading it. 
Um, I would maybe think Terrari, but it's French, so I'm thinking Terrare. Yeah, I would think Terrare. That, to me, feels like it tracks with French enunciation. So, yeah. in the 1700s, Terrare was a French man and was born and raised on a farm and had a unique problem. He never felt full after eating. That seems like a real hassle. Yeah, and so his parents obviously tried to keep him fed. They tried to keep him satisfied, and he was just eating massive amounts of food. They reportedly fed him as much as a quarter of an entire cow every day, um, which is, I, I mean, you might not think it's a lot, but that's a lot of food. It's a lot of food, especially given that cows don't grow that fast. Yeah, right. Like how you're basically going through more than a cow a week. Yeah. So you got to be buying a lot of cows. It's a lot of cows. Maybe that's where that Wendy's commercial came from. The where's the beef? It was a terrier had it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, what, that's what it was yeah he just walked around saying that and they're like oh that's a good catchphrase it's a good catchphrase yeah wendy's in the 1700s the first the first fast food restaurant <laughs> that's the origin story of france or uh, of uh wendy's not france france was right. much older than that eventually they kicked him out when he was 17 due to the insurmountable cost of feeding him could you imagine that as a parent i can't feed you anymore you gotta go yeah right i cannot that's intense i don't want to anyway no no thanks so once he's out on, he's kind of on his own and he manages to stumble across this group of sort of the pseudo makeshift circus sideshow type of thing, group of people. And essentially they would go around entertaining people. And his whole gimmick was that he would eat literally anything as long as it wasn't like straight poison or weapons, stuff that was like going to physically kill him or hurt him. He would eat pretty much anything that could be considered even distantly food. So he reportedly ate any scrap of food or any animal dead or alive. And that was a thing too. Like he just pretty much like whatever he was presented, it was, it was up for grabs and he still didn't feel full when he would eat this stuff. Yeah. Peter would have a, uh, would have a problem. <laughs> they would not be a fan of this guy. Yeah. And I mean, honestly, I think a lot of people would be pretty disturbed by this these days, particularly because he could apparently be fairly brutal about it. Yeah. And was just, just insatiable like he just he always wanted more yeah and so you might think so if you're you're gonna go to the sideshow and you're part of the reason you're going maybe is to see this man who can eat anything you might think to yourself this is a trick or maybe some kind of illusion Mm -hmm. and you might also think this is going to be this giant morbidly obese man and and for some reason you might also think i bet he smells really good (laughs) well (laughs) You'd be wrong. <laughs> wrong on all accounts. Yeah. Terrer was not a giant. He was not morbidly obese, right? Like, and he probably didn't smell very well. And it wasn't a trick. I mean, he was really eating all this stuff. Yeah. And he was actually just rail thin, like looked so thin. It looked like he was starving. And apparently the stench was, was pretty rough. Got worse as he got older, but it was apparently pretty, pretty difficult to be around. I like, get very close to him. Oh, that's a that's a bummer. So so basically, this guy Terrer is eating anything super thin, so looks can be deceiving type of situation, and smells really bad while on a circus sideshow, traveling the country of France, entertaining people with eating probably roadkill. Yeah. Uh, to be fair, let me I, let me let me back up. Seventeen hundred there's probably not a road a lot of roadkill unless it was like a slow animal like a hit by a wagon. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So that is a very fair point. <laughs> I realize that roadkill is like a fairly new invention. Yeah, that's <laughs> invention. <that's weird. laughs> Modern delicacies, if you will. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so we'll take a quick pause from Terrera and just talk about this idea of iron stomachs. It's not a very common phrase in terms of like describing an actual phenomenon. It's kind of one of those things what people will describe uh, somebody having an iron stomach, kind of eating whatever, kind of not really having like any problems with food. So yeah. essentially an iron stomach or a cast iron stomach is another term for it, is the capacity to consume without difficulty related to quantities of alcohol, spicy food, spoiled food, or other foods and drinks that would normally cause indigestion. Like, you could pretty much eat anything and not have any problems. Yeah, some people maybe would be called like a garbage disposal, and maybe this would be a helpful way of eliminating <laughs> food waste, is just having these people be the receptacle of that food waste. It's like the garbage disposal from the Flintstones. Yeah, exactly. Just uh, just a person with a cast iron stomach <laughs> under your sink. Yeah. 
Now, the origin of the term cast iron stomach became popular around the early 1900s, and cast iron is a type of metal that is commonly used in cooking. This dates back thousands of years. The first known use of cast iron cookware was during the Han Dynasty in China around 220 AD, so a very, very old type of cooking method. So we'll say 220 CE for the people who are following that, that method of calendar, if you will. Yeah. And so because of the properties of cast iron being extremely tough and, and difficult to do anything to, there was this comparison to people, person's stomachs for those who had this condition of, of having a very strong, almost indestructible stomach that could handle any food in any condition, basically. So we're going to take another like this is going to be one of those episodes where it's like layers upon layers upon layers. Sure. So we're going to take a sidebar. We're going to talk about the show Atlanta. And so in the, in the show Atlanta season three, episode 10, there's a name of the episode called that. It's called to rare. And it's in very, a very important kind of note here. Some spoilers. So fast forward, maybe about two minutes or so to avoid spoiling this episode. If you are a fan of Atlanta, and the title is named after a quote French spy from the 1700s. So this is still the same to rare, but we're talking about this guy who, again, whatever he ate basically just went right through him. As you might imagine, you're kind of wondering, how was he able to do all this? Well, basically, it would just pass through his digestive system very easily and relatively undigested. Right. And it seems that he was basically just processing. It would come out basically in the state that it was in when it went down his throat. So usually it chewed up, but also not very much digestion had happened. So yes, he was basically defecating food close to the form it was in after he chewed it. If he chewed it, that sort of thing. Right. Now, Terrer entered the army during which time they quadrupled his rations because he looked too weak. So he was basically, again, rail thin, sickly looking, and they just they gave him a, a lot more food to help with this. Yeah, and obviously they didn't really like paying for him. They're paying a lot of money to feed him, but determined they could use him as a spy. And specifically, he was commissioned as a spy for the French Army of the Rhine. And his first mission was to secretly courier a document across enemy lines in a place that could not be easily detected, which is his digestive tract. So they mm-hmm. feed him this little box with a message in it, and he would defecate it out and be able to pass along his message. That sounds painful. Yeah. So Terrer swallowed a wooden box containing this document, pass it through a system completely intact, and then be delivered to a high-ranking prisoner of war in Prussia. However, he did not speak German, and due to his unusual eating, he attracted a lot of attention, so he makes for a poor spy, because everybody's wondering where all half the cows are going. And upon entering enemy lines, he was pretty much immediately caught, and he went through a bit of torture and confessed everything and was eventually released. And fortunately, his message was only a test demonstration and contained no real information. So, this is Terrer having a real experience where he is a spy and they're using his abilities, which are not really helpful. It seems like. Yeah. So that's, I think they're referencing him as part of that, that episode. Oh, okay. And had some overlap. Yeah. I gotcha. So some medical experts, particularly in retrospect, believe that he had a condition called hyperthyroidism. And this is when your thyroid is basically working a lot harder than it should be. And it makes your metabolism extremely high. So this overactive thyroid and your thyroid gland produce too much of the hormone thyroxine or thyroxin. Mm -hmm. And so this hyperthyroidism can accelerate your body's metabolism, causing unintentional weight loss and a rapid or regular heartbeat. It's sort of like rapid starvation because you're just burning through a lot more energy than you normally should or would be in that situation. Yep. And I have hypothyroidism. So that's why I eat like a bird, as I've been told. People have told me that. They're like surprised at how little I eat given my size. Nice. I just don't eat a lot. All right. So why don't you chew on that while we pause for some ads to play? (laughs) Food puns. Okay. So we were talking about hyperthyroidism and we're going to return to our story of Terrer. So. Terrer was understandably discharged from the army. A lot of resources poured into this guy. Not really a great spy. Yeah. And he sought medical help. Did not last very long. Yeah, yeah. It couldn't last very long, I would imagine. Now, doctors experimented to see what he could eat and what would happen when he ate various foods. And, of course, they did try to help him by giving him literally every type of medicine they could think of. And this is, you know, again, 1700. So they're not working with a whole lot, but they're working with, yeah. you know, they're, they're at least trying. Yeah, so basic heavy sedatives, some things that are fairly toxic. Yeah. What have you. You know, they tried everything and just obviously wasn't wasn't gonna help him because they didn't really know what his problem was. 
and certainly didn't know what medication would actually help. They just knew that some drugs that gave people sometimes made people feel better. Yeah. And that was about as scientific as it got. So anyway, as we described, he he was essentially so hungry that he was described as being sort of animal-like and just had this myopic motivation for food to just constantly thinking about food, just wanted more food and was always needed to be eating constantly. Apparently, he even ate human bodies while he was at the hospital, like people who had died ate their bodies. And I think they even brought him bodies to see if he would. And he just dug right in. Cause he was just that feeling that starved. I want to hear the story of a family member that has to hear that information. Right. Like, you know, like it's like, um, uh, I'm so sorry for your loss. Um, we have lost the body to a man who eats everything. Yeah. So there will not be a burial because there is no body to bury because it has been eaten. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That does seem like a difficult conversation to have. Yeah. I just, it, it, yeah. And I imagine they probably are not, they were probably not, if they were delivering the bodies, they probably was not bodies of family members and stuff like that. It was probably like maybe, you know, a lot of John Doe's, right? Sure. Hopefully. Eventually the hospital got tired of him and kicked him out. They were just like, we can't do this anymore. And he ended up getting tuberculosis and dying in, in a Versailles hospital. So he ended up not even passing away from the condition that he had. He passed away from something entirely unrelated. Yeah. Interesting. So if he looked real thin beforehand, tuberculosis might probably made him look just like a skeleton, basically. Yeah. The consumption. Yeah. As Doc Holliday says in Tombstone. Yeah, exactly. Now, it's possible there was actually some accusation that he may have killed someone while he's in the hospital specifically to eat them. And yes, it was a very young person. So that also may have contributed to this. But yeah, so he died in Versailles. Apparently, his organs were essentially rotting and smelled so terribly that they could barely perform the autopsy. Apparently, while they were trying to investigate like what was going on with him and his body, they left the room several times to gag due to the smell. And they finally even just gave up on the autopsy about halfway through and just left. They're like, we can't, we're done. We're done. Wow. He's, de- he's dead. Nobody's going to like, nobody's going to miss him, bury him, get rid of him. And so it was apparently really tough. And I'm, I'm wondering if that means that like, he basically had been starting to like decay while still alive. And that that was part of what was going on there. Yeah. That is just rough. <laughs> yeah. Poor guy. Uh, yeah. Poor guy. I mean, that's uh, like, you know, the, the regardless of like what he did, it must have been really difficult to live with that condition and deal with that. Yeah, absolutely. So unfortunate. Well, let's change direction. We've been talking about food. Now let's talk about non-food. Yeah. So now we're going to talk about swords. See, you thought we were going to talk about hot dogs when you said non-food. We went a different direction here. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> when it comes to iron stomachs, you know, everything's everything's connected, right? Your stomach's connected to your esophagus and all these things. And so it's worth talking about some of the sideshow things that happen and some of these like kind of really unique experiences. And one of them is sword swallowing. And sword swallowing is typically associated as a magician's trick dating back to ancient Greece and 1200 BCE all the way up until 323 CE and Rome 625 BCE to its fall in 476 CE. This involves the swallowing of a sword without bodily injury. Now, not actually swallowing the sword and consuming it, but basically placing the sword down into the person's throat as far as it can go up to the hilt of the sword. Yeah, if it's depending on the length, for sure. Yeah. And yeah, the sword swallowing history tells us that this behavior, again, we have all the way back in sort of ancient Greece or ancient Rome. This is a suggestion that it maybe originated in ancient Rome. It's not actually an illusion, and it's not really a trick. It is actually someone putting an actual sword down their throat. Uh Uh-huh. So... Quick trigger warning on some gross anatomy stuff. Yeah, we're going to do the trigger warning now, not after Terrer ate a body. Like, this is when we're going to do this. So, (laughs) (laughs) just, you know, (laughs) yeah. Cannibalism, fine. Fine. Eating swords, that's where I draw the line. Yeah, that's, we draw the line. We start talking about the uvula. So, (laughs) no. Those who practice sword swallowing must first overcome some reflex at the objects touching the back of the parts of their mouth. So, For me, you can't even touch the front of my throat without me gagging. So, like, there's never going to be a time where I'm a sword swallower, just so everybody's aware. Like, that's not going to end up on my resume. (laughs) It's just just rough. That's why I can't wear ties. So, going back to National Tie Day, can't do it. You're right. This is is an episode of Making Connections right now. Yeah, that's it. (laughs) Synchronicities, baby. 
All right, so you have the pharynx, which is basically right at the back of the throat, sort of behind your tongue area. And this also, again, has to be conditioned to do sword swallowing. So objects that get introduced here can cause a lot of pain. And so it's just a lot of basically deconditioning, if you will, trying to overcome that reflex so that you can start to pass things past that point without a lot of discomfort, which just sounds horrible, you know? Yeah. Don't like it. Yeah. And we're going to be talking more about this and it's a totally different story. But yes, that is that is part of it is the is being able to train your body not to react to foreign objects going in places they're not supposed to go. Do you know how hard it is for me to use regular utensils? Like I can't even put like a fork in my mouth past my teeth. Like that's an accomplishment for me to put a fork in my mouth and be like, okay, we're good. <laughs> like anything else that's not supposed to be in my mouth past my, like past my teeth. I'm going to start gagging. So anyway, the stomach is conditioned in a similar manner. So sword swallowers will employ slightly varying methods while one may swallow a sword without using any intermediate apparatus, such as a gutta percha tip, which is kind of like, it looks like a, uh, almost like a chopstick, mm-hmm. but I think it's longer than that. I would imagine. Imagine. Yeah. The majority of sword swallowers employ a guiding tube, which w- they have previously ingested, and hence their performances are less dangerous. So the tube is about 45 to 50 centimeters, or for you know those folks live using imperial measures, 17.7 to 19.7 inches. And it's made of a very thin metal with a width of about 25 milliliters, which is a little less than an inch. The tube permits easy entry of a flat bladed sword. So basically they have swallowed this tube. It's already inside of their body and the sword goes into that tube almost like a sheath in your esophagus yeah and you'd pretty much have to because even a dull blade could do an enormous amount of damage if you didn't have some protection against it yeah all right so that is sword swallowing so we're gonna pivot just a little bit but somewhat related there is this idea of an iron stomach like being able to take a lot of damage to your stomach specifically Mm -hmm. so in this case iron meaning sort of tough from outside forces. And that brings us to a story about a man many people in the United States likely would have heard of, Frank Cannonball Richards. What a great nickname, by the way. Yeah, that is good. Even if he wasn't known for what he was going, like what he was doing, like I think call like having the nickname of Cannonball is pretty great. Yeah, they're like, hey, Frank, and he said, you can call me Cannonball. <laughs> Cannonball to you, sir. <laughs> But I imagine because he was born in Kansas in 1887, so I imagine he talks like this. So he's like, you know, it's never That's like, a good point. yeah, he's like, ah, no, Frank, no, 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 no. There's no Frank Richards here. It's Cannibal, Cannibal. You see, like I see him doing that. He actually, I did get to watch a video of him doing this performance, and that is not uh, an unreasonable way of describing how he talks. <laughs> I love that. That's now head cannon. We'll say that. Head cannon ball. <laughs> Love it. If you get to do puns, I get to do puns too. Heck yeah. So uh, while in the army, he discovered that he could take a lot of force to his stomach. And after the war, he joined performance circuits. Sounds like a trend here. Everybody ends up in like the, the sideshow with big fish. Right. And so in which people would punch him in the stomach, hit him in the stomach with a hammer, jump on his stomach, and finally have a cannonball shot at his stomach, which is parodied on an episode of The Simpsons, which is absolutely wonderful. It's a good one. Homer just getting shot in the stomach with a cannon over, over, and over again. Yep, absolutely. And mm-hmm. in that one, it sort of reaches critical mass of like how much damage he can take. And yeah, he's like, I can take one more and that's it. Like, yep. he's like, it's basically going to kill him. Yeah, that, that's essentially what's going on with him. They sort of described him as having this so called quote unquote iron clad gut, if you will. But now, although all the other things that was happening to him actually did happen, people were legitimately punching him and kicking him in the stomach as hard as they could. He even had some heavyweight boxers come up and punch him in the stomach and he just sort of like he kind of leans back a little bit but otherwise like yeah do it again give it a shot Ugh. but he actually the way he says it's kind of funny he's like that was great try it again <laughs> and he has a sort of <laughs> newsy sort of speak that you were suck me again fellow exactly <laughs> that was sharp try your hand again <laughs> anyway all of that stuff was real um and and he people would basically line up and they would just go through the line, punching him in the stomach. There are videos of this. If you look on YouTube, you can you can see people just lining up to punch him in the stomach over and over and the, again, or jump on his stomach or whatever. But the cannonball thing was actually just an illusion. This was just a trick. Like, if you think about this, a real cannonball, just in general, like a picture an actual real cannonball. Yeah. Would just tear an ironclad person in half 
and has. There are plenty of examples of it where cannonballs are do an incredible amount of damage. Yes. So even the toughest person's bare skin would be hardly any sort of match for a cannonball. What they did do was they would use a 100-pound ball shot out of a cannon via a spring-loaded action, very similar to an airsoft gun. So as uh, Job from Arrested Development say, would say, it wasn't a trick, it was an illusion. <laughs> yep. They added a small smoke explosion for visual effects, and it would definitely be painful to get shot with. It would still hurt. Like, it would still not feel yeah. good to get hit in the stomach with a metal ball that's like projected at you. Definitely. But it was very unlikely to be deadly to most people, whether it's a real cannonball or not, or a cannonball firing. This specific one, the way that they set up the illusion would just be pretty, pretty rough. Yeah, yeah, definitely not real for, from the perspective of cannons and cannonballs, because that would vaporize his body. But it was basically just that that trick. And so there's very famous videos and images of slow motion, the cannonball being launched out of the the thing. There's a little puff of smoke again, probably a sound effect. Maybe the explosion was real. I don't know. Yeah. And it was it was powerful enough to knock him backward. Like you wouldn't want to get hit with this. You'd be very, very sore. And if he got hit you in the head, he'd definitely knock you out. Yeah. But yeah, he was going to be okay with the situation. So that was kind of the whole thing for him. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to do this. Like, I don't want to get hurt. Yeah. Like, I don't want to get shot with this stuff. Like, I, I, it's not a question I need answered, you know? Right. Like, there's some people that are like, I think I could climb Mount Everest. I'm like, I hope that you can. That's just not my thing, right? Like, for the same <laughs> yeah. reason, like, getting shot with a cannonball. I don't want to get shot with a cannonball. I don't want you to get shot with a cannonball. But, I mean, if you want to do that, I guess you can. But be careful, please. Yeah, and just as a, as a quick aside, uh, it was kind of a twist on the trick that had been around for a lot longer, which was being shot out of a cannon. <laughs> People had done that. And so this was sort of a different version, which was having a cannon be shot at you. And it actually, nobody, as far as I could find, has actually done this since Frank Cannonball Richards did this, which is a good thing. I think yeah. don't do this. Don't even bother with it. Now I'm just thinking of all the variations of this trick. So I could get shot out of a cannon. I could get shot with a cannon. Could I shoot a cannon out of me? <laughs> yeah. Like, now I'm just kind of doing all those variations. of like, what is it like, you know? Like, could I shoot a smaller <laughs> cannon out of a larger cannon? You know, that's, could I, you know, there's all these, there's all these things. I, I just, it's, it's now my, now my creativity, like now my creative mind is going places. That is the beauty of the, of the human mind. I love it. Okay. Well, if you can stomach these ads, <laughs> then you're on your way to also having an iron stomach. We'll be right back. Okay, so we've been describing various versions of Iron Stomach, sword swallowing, being punched in the gut with a pretend cannonball, that sort of thing. And now we're on to sort of our third and final story of an iron gut in a kind of different way. We are going to talk about competitive eating, which is, if you thought the other stuff was gross, there's probably another trigger warning. Cannibalism, again, don't need the trigger warning, but maybe this is gross because we are. This is where the hot dogs come in. So let's talk about Joey Christian Chestnut, who was born in California in 1983 and now lives in Indiana. And he has won about 14 hot dog eating competitions, which is probably the worst thing I've ever said on the show. <laughs> I could be wrong. I think it was 14. It's possible he's up to 15 now. There, I saw various news things about him, but it's around 14. In 2021 is when I think he had his 14th victory, which is why he might be at 15 now. Yeah. But he ate a record setting 76 hot dogs, which <laughs> for the record, like a few years ago, his record was 69. So he's already up seven more hot dogs from that. This is approximately 22,000 calories and some change, which would be enough to last you over four months of like normal calorie. If you were sort of stretching that out of like how much calories you could sort of live on. If you were to pack those away, you should make it a, about four months or so if you're distributing that evenly. Yeah. So that's a ton of hot dogs. Yeah. I mean, and that's unless you're Michael Phelps or the rock who you can eat that in a meal because you burn that much in a day, just practicing swimming or working out or whatever they do. Right. That's just a kind of a, just a horrible thing, but he makes $10,000 for getting first place. So $10,000 might be worth taking. What is it like per hot dog? It's like three minutes off your life per hot dog or something like that. They say, <laughs> right. Yeah. Something like that. So I guess it's worth it. <laughs> it's a lot of minutes that have, are lost. It's a lot of minutes. Yeah. It's like, I, I took three <laughs> months off my life for this contest. $10,000 worth it. Well, and that's what I was kind of wondering is like, what are, what do people win? I did see as high as like 50 or $60,000 in some instances, but it was usually something like you get 
cash, a small amount of cash, and then like a car, and then a gift certificate for more hot dogs or something. I don't want an Oscar Mayer, like a lifetime supply of Oscar Mayer, right? Like at that point in time. But I have a question for you before we go on to this next part. Shoot. If you had to join, like partake in an, e- an eating contest like this, what mm-hmm. what would be the food that you would like, you know, you would win at? Feel good about iceberg lettuce. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I like that. I like that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> for enjoyment of the thing probably mushrooms but yeah there yeah. we go okay i'll take that i'll take that see i was like i would probably do pretty well in a donut eating contest but that's that's a different problem yeah oh, okay <laughs> <laughs> did not expect lettuce so thank you for that <laughs> i was like what's the lightest like least dense food i can think of that i could probably eat a lot of I can't wait to see that competition where it's like, like one day, you know, of why we do what we do fame. Abraham ate 76 heads of lettuce, which is all of 15 calories. He literally turned green. He literally turned green and got five bucks for it. 15, 15 calories. (laughs) Anyway, we were talking about food competitions. Yes. Uh, Another thing I was curious about and, and understanding sort of the why people do this sort of thing. And how people do it. I think that's that's maybe the thing that people wonder is like, how do you eat 76 hot dogs? And the answer is not easily at all. People actually train really hard for these and not in like a way that sounds cool to me or fun or fun. Maybe that's what I'm looking, I'm looking for. This just sounds uncomfortable. Like other training things sound like, OK, I get that. You have to really push yourself. This is. This is rough. Okay, so one of them is very similar to sword swallowing is to overcome that gag reflex of putting so much stuff in your throat so rapidly. So that's one thing that you have to train for. Yeah, as part of that, they have to train their esophagus to allow more food to pass through more easily. So basically, they have to kind of like overcome that process where when you swallow your esophagus just squeezes food all the way down. It's just basically like you're going to open it up and just let food pour down your throat. Yeah, I heard that they legitimately sort of are able to expand it slightly. Yeah. Which slightly can make a big difference in this case, but that's tough. Yeah, especially for folks that eat two hot dogs at a time. (laughs) All right. (laughs) They also like physically train their stomachs to be able to expand pretty significantly beyond typical capacity. I saw up to four times what the amount it should be able to hold is, which is pretty rough. And by training, of course, we mean just get used to it they're sort of slowly stretching their stomach out over time yeah and they spend months or years doing this right so like you're talking right, about yeah. like you know every now and again they're they're eating just a little bit beyond the capacity and getting used to that new that new kind of level and then building it like a building higher capacity beyond that which is a it's kind of scary and also gross Yeah, so in these competitions, obviously, the primary factors are speed and volume. That's what you're looking Mm -hmm. for. How quickly can you eat how much food? And so the 76 hot dogs was, I believe, 76 in 10 minutes. (sighs) And this is just like nonstop shoving it down your throat as fast as you possibly can. 76 in 10 minutes? Yeah. And this is legitimately like dunking it in water frequently to help it slide down there. Like it's more lubricated to slide down their throat. So you're getting this weird mash of unmasticated. Well, sometimes a little bit masticated, but largely just mash of food stuff. That's just like a a mush going down your gullet. That is straight up like seven and a half hot dogs a minute. So that is more than a hot dog every 10 seconds. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) That's about a hot dog every eight, eight seconds. Yeah, that is a lot. I don't like that. Now, the thing with this is that it's very dangerous because the, the part of this is that we don't really know the long term effects of this type of training or the amount of consuming this like large amount of calories in such a small amount of time. It's really unknown how this impacts people's lives. Yeah. And I mean, there's the immediate effects, which is that people will have indigestion and heartburn and cramps and diarrhea, vomiting, acid reflux, like all kinds of the symptoms that are very problematic. I mean, you got to consider like how much of all the various nutrients there are and things that, like how much sodium is that right. And enough to yeah. functionally stop yeah. your heart. So it's a lot of things that you're, you're consuming. And another thing here is that people will often take medication to try and help themselves compete various things that are, I didn't read through a specific list, but essentially looking for effects like, Muscle relaxation potentially is one that they might take. 
and others are things to like just help prepare for like pain you know of like i'm about to be extremely uncomfortable uh sort of thing and another thing that happens sadly is that they can do a lot of damage to their stomachs and because their stomachs expand the way that they they do they push on their other internal organs which can cause some internal bleeding and also do damage to their organs so people have to have surgery to repair their stomachs or other organs sometimes after doing these competitions for ten thousand dollars yeah maybe i'm sorry for maybe ten thousand dollars for a chance yeah to win ten thousand dollars like that's not guaranteed that you're gonna win yeah that yeah that's only if you're first place yeah that's only if you first place unfortunately too some people choke and several people have died during eating competitions which is really problematic and one eater even reported developing arthritis in his jaw by 29 years old it's rough that is rough yeah and another consideration on this that's not necessarily dangerous with respect to human health but just the fact that this is a just colossal waste of food yeah these are not people who are eating food scraps that we were talking about earlier. They're like, these have to be manufactured and obviously it's shipped and purchased and like prepared and all of that. So this is just for nothing more than the spectacle and the competition and some cash, the pretty gigantic waste of, of resources. And people wonder why the United States are <laughs> seen the way that we are, you know? Yeah. Like people are like, People can't be mad at us. It's like this man just ate 76 hot dogs in 10 minutes. There are people that like can't even make a meal in a day, like in this country. And this is what we're doing. Anyway, that's that's neither here nor there. That's not to bring that down. It's also for some folks that are going through this, it can be very painful to digest this food. I mean, you're talking about a large quantity, a large volume of food that is that requires your body to process it because it is inside your body, unless you're unless you're Terrer, who does not have that issue where it just kind of passes through. But even then he's dealing with some other things yeah that is our story about competitive eating Mm -hmm. so we have some other things that are just kind of interesting to talk about they're a little bit related they're not exactly the same thing but kind of close one is called marfan syndrome this is people who the reason i bring it up is because they can essentially eat as much as they can eat and they never gain weight right like some people might think oh that sounds wonderful i think if you talk to someone with marfan they would not say this is wonderful This usually has several other physical things. They're usually very tall, very thin, and they can't put on muscle very easily. Um, They can't put on any kind of weight. They often have vision problems and have extreme nearsightedness, as well as some heart problems, including some heart murmurs and other cardiovascular health issues. They might have issues with their spine. Their spine might be curved. They might have flat feet. They might have, I've seen some folks that have like their, their joints will grow larger than it's kind of like the average, which can cause joint pain and, and, and different things like that. Um, we, we had talked about this, uh, before the show and Peter Mayhew, who plays Chewbacca in the original star Wars, he is somebody who has this. And if you look at kind of how he would stand and how he would carry himself and how he would walk. He would have to walk with a cane and he, it was, it was very uncomfortable for him to, to kind of walk around and move. Yeah. I've heard that it is fairly, it can be fairly painful. People with Marfan tend to have disproportionately long arms and legs and fingers, a breastbone that protrudes outward or dips inward. So your breastbone can just be a little bit different how it's shaped Mm -hmm. and often requires some surgery because it can be kind of messing up internal organs. And then can have an arched palate in their mouth and have crowded teeth as well. Yeah. So it's fairly unpleasant most of the time I've heard people report about this. Yeah. Now, another thing that might happen that can contribute to this type of eating or being able to eat, like overeat or anything like that, is a a specific gene that prevents people from gaining weight. It's not linked to any specific illness, but 1% of the population has this. And essentially what it means is like you can continue to eat and eat and eat and you will just never gain weight no matter how many calories you consume. Yeah, and it's, I think it was on something called like the ALK gene, if I, re, if I remember correctly, but yeah, something like that. There's a genetic thing that affects just a small handful of people. Mm-hmm. 1% obviously is a lot of people, if you think about it, but yeah. um, it's relative to most, like you're unlikely to be in that 1% because right. it's 1%, <laughs> you know? Right. This doesn't really include this in this conversation. That was a lot of the word this. There's another condition called Prater Willie. It's not really what we're talking about here. It's kind of its own thing and definitely deserves its own episode. But people who have Prater Willie as a diagnosis will often report or essentially behave as though they don't ever really feel full. Like they just kind of always want to eat. Now, they do not have the issue of not gaining weight and like food just passing through them, but they just kind of 
never really feel satisfied Mm -hmm. as sort of the experience that happens. Yeah. And some extreme behavior can come out of food seeking in in those spaces. So a lot of times somebody with clear willy will have, will be on specific restricted diets where they have like a lower caloric intake because of how much they can consume per day. Right. There's a related disorder called polydipsia where somebody is consistently thirsty. Yeah. And they over drink and you can actually drown your cells as a result of that too. Like you can consume so yeah. much water that your cells will over absorb water and start to burst. Yeah. I've actually heard there are far more people in the United States who die from overhydrating than do from lack of sufficient hydration. Yeah. Pretty much uh, almost nobody dies of thirst in the United States. Yeah. Basically you drown yourself. Is what happens when you overhydrate. Yeah. Another condition that we have to talk about when it comes to kind of thinking about what iron stomachs do and like consuming stuff is pica. If you're not familiar with pica, what it is is it's essentially ingesting, chewing and ingesting non food items or non nutrition items, nutritious items. Like you might have people that chew on rocks or eat shoes. I mean, you see people when they talk about, you know, the show My Strange Addiction, when you have somebody on there who's like eating the foam on the couch or eating toilet paper. Those are examples of pica. And so those are kind of, you know, more, you know, show business types of examples. But I've worked with learners who have had that where they've just eaten handfuls of gravel or dirt or leaves or cigarette butts off the ground and stuff like that. And it can be pretty dangerous. This happens a lot in pregnant women as well. Mm. You'll find that like pregnant women kind of come up with like a temporary type of pica where they'll want to consume like cleaning fluids because it smells a certain way, like stuff like that. Oh, interesting. The one that comes up a lot are like the soles of shoes. That's one thing that I've heard uh, several times. I think we should look into this and talk about it more. Yeah, it will be an episode one day. That's fascinating. Okay, that's kind of it. That's what we have on Iron Stomachs. It's just kind of this uh, interesting thing that that there's various versions of what this can and, and might be. But yeah, that's, <laughs> I think, what we got for you. Take-home points, I think, are just that this is... There's kind of various versions of what people mean when they talk about an iron stomach. It's usually some version of either very tough, meaning it can take external damage well... Or it's very tough in that it can take an uh, enormous amount of internal food consumption, be it food that is not in good condition or maybe excessively spicy or or just a lot, uh, just a high volume of it, that sort of thing. So that's sort of what it is and the ways that it's talked about. And because it's so unique and, and fairly rare in terms of like specific medical disorders, it's very difficult to kind of pin down any sort of like psychological relation to it, right? Like it's not really something that is like a psychosomatic thing where people are like, I've got to overeat and da 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 because we're not talking about eating disorders. That's an entirely different set of things to kind of unpack, right? Like this is something that's like very specific and typically has some kind of medical thing. Or when it comes to stuff like food competitions, it is a more of like an entertainment thing yeah and so like when it comes to the the question of why we do what we do i think that this one doesn't really have a a clear kind of well this is where this comes from because there are so many different variations of what iron stomachs look like how people do it and what the outcomes are of those things yeah well ten thousand dollars is why some people do it Mm -hmm. or a gift card to olive garden yeah that (laughs) the other thing to say that i would leave this with for me is that this is not something you generally want. Even the even like the being able to take external damage type of thing, I think it's still be a little bit little bit dangerous. So you probably don't want to be on the side of the of having an iron stomach. It seems like most of the people for whom this has been the case have had some complications as a result of of whatever their situation was. Absolutely. Yeah. It's not one of those things that sounds like it it doesn't sound pleasant to have. It doesn't sound like a superpower. It sounds like it's actually pretty debilitating. Yeah. All right, well anything else before we do some recommendations? Nope, I got nothing else. Recommendations. All right. So these are our recommendations they're personal which means that they're stuff that we like and we think that other people might like them and i'm going to make a recommendation that a lot of people already know that they like but if you don't and you haven't tried this before then i suggest it and that is sesame seed bagels (laughs) this is the second time this has come up in my life in the last two days i have never had a (laughs) sesame seed bagel but uh it was on another podcast they were like that is the best bagel oh i love sesame seed bagels i think it's definitely worth trying at least. So yeah. if you're into bagels and you're into sesame seeds and you would like to try that, I, I recommend it. They're my favorite type. And, uh, and that's why I'm, I'm throwing them out there is just to go, go check it out if you haven't already. And if you do like sesame seed bagels, then maybe go treat yourself to one because I mentioned it. I like that. I like that. Maybe I'll do that for lunch. 
There you go. My recommendation is a book called Big Fish. You may be familiar with the movie that was directed by um, Tim Burton, starring Ewan McGregor, and it is beautiful, and it is incredible and touching. Yeah. Well, it's based on a book, if you didn't know that. The book is written by Daniel Wallace, and it's very short. I read it in just a couple hours, and it was really wonderful. Like they did a They did a pretty good job. I will say this, though. There are very few instances where I think the movie is better than the book. The movie is better than the book. Oh. I think it's more fleshed out and more interesting in terms sure. of or more linear, I should say. It's a little bit more linear. Okay. And you can see kind of in the book how they combine certain things and they tie things together. So Got it. And they add some cool things. But the book is done very well. And um one of my th- one of my favorite things is they talk about when the the father is passing away, you kind of see the son take himself less seriously and start kind of taking on the storytelling role, which happens in Mm -hmm. the movie, but they go like, you know, there's different takes of the same scenario that I think is really cool. So it's worth reading and it's a quick read and easy read. And it's, it's a lot of fun. Should have probably issued a spoiler warning for that, but um, (laughs) there. Oh yeah. Spoiler warning. If you hadn't seen this uh, movie that came out 20 years ago. (laughs) Yes. Early 2000s. (laughs) Anyway, but yeah, good movie. Good book. Uh, I haven't read the book, but good movie. Reportedly good book. <laughs> I, I'm on board. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that recommendation. And anyway, if you'd like to tell us about a book turned movie where the movie is just a little better, but you still like the book or some <laughs> particular breakfasty or lunchy type foods that you enjoy that are common, but other people should appreciate as well, mm-hmm. then you can reach out to us and tell us all about those things. If you've got more stories or more information to add to our discussion about iron stomachs or your experience with food competitions or having an iron stomach, I'd certainly be interested in hearing from you. It'd be really fun to uh, to have some stories that people are willing to share. So you should you should email us. As I said, it's info at www.wwdpodcast.com. And we're also on the, um, the non-hate speech platforms on social media that you can reach out to us and we will respond to people there. True. And if you would like to support the show and the things that we do, you can join us on Patreon. And there you'll get all kinds of access to benefits like behind the scenes content. You get to see our notes and the pictures we put in our notes and the comments we leave to each other in our notes. You get early access to episodes and add free versions of episodes and all that sort of thing. So head on over to Patreon. You can support us there. And there are already people. There's a community of people that you can join. And that includes the likes of Amanda, Brad, The Daily BA, Joshua, Justin, Justine, Kim, Kelly, Kostia, Layla, Megan, Mike M, Mike T, Shauna, and Stephanie. Thank you all for your continued support and helping us do what we do. They're the how behind the why if you will. Yes, absolutely. Some other people who are also the how behind the why includes my awesome team of people, which is Jess, Patrick, Justin, and of course, Shane, thank you so so much for recording with me today. Thank you so much. And then also to a shout out to Selena who helped start the, to, to kick off these notes for us for this one. It was not an easy one to get this one together. And I didn't mean to leave off Alan. He's also still a part of the team. He's just been out for uh, for parental duty. Mm-hmm. And so we'll have him back. He's still he's still a, a valuable contribution. And we'd love having him around. Absolutely. Of course, we wouldn't really do this show if we didn't have people who decided to listen to us talk about the things that we talk about. And so, of course, thank you, listeners, and all the things that you do. Of course. You're all wonderful, and we love you. Indeed. You can also support us by picking up some merch from our merch store, sporting some beanies and stickers and jackets and whatever um go go check it out there's lots of stuff there you know it's christmas time so those make great secret santa gifts and white elephant gifts exchanges if you're doing something like that absolutely add that to your wish list too if you're on a secret santa exchange mm-hmm. yes <laughs> so someone else will get it for you 100 <laughs> okay i think that is all that i have is there anything that i missed or anything you'd like to add before we take off shane nope just take care of yourselves don't eat too spicy food that's gonna make you sick indeed perfect all right well then i think that we are done this is abraham and this is Shane. We're out. See ya. You've been listening to Why We Do What We Do. You can learn more about this and other episodes by going to www.podcast.com. Thanks for listening, and we hope you have an awesome day. Hey.